words in Latin. That might be the sign of something. Here we go. So, uh, how's everyone doing today? Good. Tired. Well, tomorrow's Friday. The weekend is right around the corner, right? Um, I work. Me too. It happens, right? So today, uh, I know that you've been, I, I know what you've been studying with Mr. Boino uh, and getting ready for the morality and the different specific topics that we're going to cover. Today what we're going to discuss is going to also be some foundational stuff that you'll need in order to enter into that dialogue on the different moral topics, different ethic topics. But also Mr. Boino is going to go into more detail with you on this stuff. So this is a good transition for us and a good kind of foundation, all right? Today we're going to talk about the Imago Dei, uh, being created in the image and likeness of God. If we could, it's hard to put a definition to this, but if we were going to try to define it, we would have, there would be two components. The first component would be this. It's a theological concept which points out that man is created in the image and likeness of God. Theological concept <clears throat> that man is created in the image and likeness of God. But more so than just a concept, it's a real reality of the human person. So it's not just an idea, but it's a reality that exists in each one of us, and it's something that we participate in as uh, human beings, okay? So in the event that you'd be asked to try to define uh, Imago Dei, the Imago Dei, this would be a very basic, very simple way to, to explain it. We're going to get in depth a little bit more. Uh, how many of you know, some of you should know, what does the word etymology mean? E-T-Y-M-O-L-O-G-Y. It's the origin of a word. Right, the origin of a word. So, if you notice, Imago Dei on the board, on the uh, projector, is not, that's not English. It's obviously Latin. The reason I kept it that way is, in Catholic theology and Catholic morality, you will see this term come up. It, that's just how theology works. You're going to see these groups of terms that come up in the language that they were formulated in, and rather than dumb it down and translate everything into English for you, I'd rather show you the words and so that you can recognize them when you're reading or when discussion and thing comes, things come up, right? So, imago and dei. Um, imago, what English word does this look like? Image. Image, right? And that's where the... the English word image comes from. It comes from this Latin word imago. And very simply, it's an, the, an imago and, and a definition of imago would be likeness, similarity, or sameness. Right? If you had to put one word to it, it would be image. And then we have day. For those of you that like languages or take languages, you know that there's different, um, there can be um, you know, the nominative, the accusative, the genitive, the ablative, all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, in Latin, the Genitive of Deus is Dei. Basically, in English, we show this by putting an apostrophe S on the end of words. In Spanish, we put Dei in front of it. Please excuse this interruption. Mr. Dave Staler, please, report, please call the main office. Mr. Dave Staler, please call the main office. So in English, we put apostrophe S. In Latin, we would put Dei before Dios, right, of God. In, or in Spanish, rather. In Latin, it's the ending of the words that make, make the difference. So in Latin, Dei is of God. Deus would be just God. Okay. So, very simply, Imago Dei is image of God. Where does it come from? Uh, any good Catholic morality and good Catholic theology is going to have its basis in divine revelation, which is scripture and tradition but also in the reality that exists in the world. So we're, we don't set ourselves apart from um, human nature and from nature in general, right? God's created world. Uh, this concept, this idea of the Imago Dei comes from very early in the scriptures, Genesis 1, 27. Yes? Uh, you want to be able to recognize Genesis 1, 27. Genesis 127. God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So if you're familiar with the Bible, which hopefully you are uh, somewhat, you know that Genesis is the first book of the Old Testament, and chapter 1 is the first chapter of that first book. And it's very early in the chapter, verse 27, not too far 
after the creation account, uh, that God finishes his creation account with the creation of man. And he creates man in his image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. Uh, we do need to make an important distinction. And this is going to help us when we get into theology or morality more. But when we see this word man in, in Catholicism, we have to be very careful not to fall into the trap the world sets for us. Um, there are a lot of people who are not Catholic, and some people who are Catholic, who would accuse the church of being sexist. Uh, that, you know, there's all this masculine language of male, man, all this stuff, and that women are, you know, some, somehow second to men. Um, we can just prove that for a few reasons. One, in Latin, there are words that, in English, we use the same word in English, but it has, has multiple meanings in Latin. In, word, in Latin, there's a word for man, as in, like, I am a male, I'm a man, and we are men, right? Mr. Bueno and I, we are men. And that word is vir. Okay? That's where we get the word virtue from. There's also a Latin word called, that is homo. This is where we have the word for homo sapien, right? And when the church speaks of man, very often this is the one that she's speaking of. This notion of man as humankind or mankind. Right? It's not the church's way to oppress or suppress women. Right? Unfortunately, in the, in the um, society we live in, if you don't put the H-E before it, or the K-I-N-D after it, somehow you're not being politically correct and you're slugging women. It's not the church's intention by using this word made. Right? Another way you can combat this to people is, if the, women, if the church doesn't like women or hates women, then explain the devotion and the primacy of Mary. I mean, we lift the Blessed Mother up next to God. She's like, you know, number two. Right? I mean, so much so that there's a you know three-foot statue in the back of the room. Right? The rosary and all this other kind of stuff. Um, so it's, it's, it's not anything like that. Also, if you notice, we refer to the church in a female character. So like the church, she refers to, we never say he. It's just something I thought would be worthwhile to point out. Have any of you ever seen this picture before? Okay. For those of you that have, have seen it, do you know what it is a picture of or do you have any details about, about the picture? Take a guess, maybe. Yes. Isn't it not supposed to be God reaching for something for us? Very good. So it's, it's God reaching out to man, right? What else? Do you know who painted it or where it's at or anything like that? I gave it away. I told you it's a painting. Very good. Michelangelo in the in the Sistine Chapel. Where is the Sistine Chapel located? In Rome. In the Vatican, right? In Rome. So close your eyes for a second. Trust me. Close your eyes. Keep them closed. Okay, we just got off the plane. We landed in the Vatican. You can open your eyes up. And we're standing in the Sistine Chapel. Uh, this music is not my music. It's part of the Vatican website music. So this is not I don't have like a playlist rolling in the background. Uh, it's going to get louder a little bit. So uh, to give you an idea of what we're looking at here, this is the Sistine Chapel. And this is, we can actually thank students from Villanova University. who are studying over in Rome. They took pictures of all of all of the Sistine Chapel and all these other beautiful basilicas and cathedrals. And with the Vatican's help and their approval, they made this stuff accessible to people all throughout the world for the first time. It used to be that up until a few years ago, the only way you could see these sites would be if you could actually get on a plane, travel to Rome, go into the Vatican and you know, wait in line for an hour and get in and see the beauty and grandeur of the Sistine Chapel. I've never been there. I would like to still go, but... We don't all have, like, two grain to hop on a plane today, so this is uh, as best as we can do. Um, I would like to point out that if you get car sick or nauseous on rides, that uh, I understand if you don't look at the screen, because we're going to start to move in the Sistine Chapel, okay? So, so this is the Sistine Chapel. This is the place where the conclave occurs after the Pope dies or after he abdicates his throne, uh, his chair of Peter. You can see the beautiful artwork. Let me 
we get back and face the altar again, we look directly up at the ceiling. And this is where Michelangelo's famous frescoes are painted. Uh, a fresco is a painting where basically... Oh, I'm getting nauseous now. There we go. A fresco is basically a painting where the artist paints into like a wet plaster. And as the plaster dries, the, the colors stay. And so the painting is almost like part of the ceiling. This is great to preserve the painting because it lasts for hundreds of years. I mean, plaster just lasts. Uh, it's kind of terrible if you mess up a painting because then you've got to let it dry, chisel it off, and start over. So there's really no like hiding or painting over like you could on a canvas. All right? um, I'm going to zoom in to show you the full painting. Now, if you haven't noticed yet, you will now. Uh, at this point in the history of, of art, uh, before the Renaissance and in the Renaissance, the, the human body was very well respected. So there's a lot of uncl there's a lot of like naked human bodies in Michelangelo's painting. I figured that like if this was a freshman class, people would be out of control laughing and all that kind of stuff. But I figured since you guys are juniors, I told you they were going to get loud. I figured since you were juniors, I could show you the actual fresco. All right. So we have Adam and God, right? What is, what is Adam doing in this painting? How would you describe Adam? Right, he's just kind of sitting there. He's got his, his leg up, his arm is just kind of on his knee, and he's just kind of laying back, right? How about God? How about God? God's like, he's putting everything into his effort to reach out and to touch Adam, right? Um, Michelangelo painted, like, Adam's pretty jacked. God is pretty jacked. Um, and then there's, like, a bunch of fat, chubby angels behind him, like baby angels. I don't understand what their thing was with, like, angels being these fat, like, chubby kids. But that's how they, I mean, it's, look, I mean, that's, that's how they, did, like, the, all these fat angels, these fluffy kids are just, like, floating around God, right? So he, I mean, if this is the heavens, he's, God is doing everything he can, all his energy, all his focus, all his effort, is breaking through and just touching, just getting ready to touch the fingertip of Adam, right? This is Michelangelo's attempt to show that everything that happens is God first and that we receive. God first and that we receive. So God is creating Adam, and Adam is just, it's just happening. He's not doing anything, it's, it's being done to him. Right? Uh, it's interesting to point out that while he's creating Adam, and in the Genesis story, God creates Adam first, and then from Adam creates Eve, uh, God already has Eve in his arm. So I think it's kind of neat that Michelangelo, while, while God's creating Adam, he already has this idea of Eve in his arm, and that as soon as Adam's created, he creates Eve then to be, for Adam to have a companion. So if and when you ever get to Rome, and some of you definitely will when you study abroad or take vacations. Go in the Sistine Chapel and look up when you're standing in the middle and you'll get to see this uh, actual fresco. Okay? And then send me a postcard because you'll probably get there before I do. Mm -hmm. At least in the next four years of, when you go to college. So don't write these three down, but I want to discuss them. Uh, in Genesis, God brings order out of chaos, light out of darkness. God creates man in his own image and likeness purely out of love. And God gives dominion over the fish, gives man dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and all living creatures. Right? The first point, I think, is a good reminder for us as Christians that even when things in our life seem to be overpowering and overwhelming, we can look back at God all throughout human history and see that it is possible for him, and he does this. He brings light out of darkness. He brings order out of chaos. All right? We're reminded of that in his creation story in Genesis. We're also reminded that God creates us not out of any other reason but for love, because he loves. God is love, and in his love he creates humankind. And then this third point, God gives man dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and all living creatures. What do you think this means? God gives dominion 
over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, all living creatures. Isn't we kind of, um, we're kind of higher than them, but we're also, they're also in our care, like it's our job to take care of them? Good, so not just kind of higher, we are. We're the pinnacle of God's creation, right? We're the high point of God's creation. In the first Genesis account, God creates us last. In the second Genesis account, God creates us first. Right? In Genesis 1, it's, it's all creation and then man. In Genesis 2, it's man, and then from man, God then creates everything else. He does everything else after. It's an emphasis of the author of Genesis to say that men and women are the pinnacle of God's creation. Right? But you're right. It's our job to take care of these things, but also to use them for our own benefit and our own ability. So, good Catholic theology is both and, right? We don't have to be uh, like a crazy psychopathic hunter, I hunt, but we don't have to be like a crazy psychopathic hunter where every time we see a living human being, or a living human being, uh, no, an animal, a creature, that we try to like run them off the road or something to kill them just for fun. But we also don't have to be a, like, you know, we don't have to feel our, our conscience is, is somehow like, you know, affected if we want to eat a hamburger for lunch on a Thursday. Right? So it's this balance of both ends. So in that statement, I just offended PETA and the NRA, probably. So um, I'm just kidding. Uh, but it, it, right, God gives dominion. When we think of dominion, we should think of kingship. We should think of ruler, right? Like King's Dominion is a, it's a theme park. But this idea that we have power, we, and it's our job not just to use them, but to preserve and to take care of and to continue to allow that to happen for generations and generations to come. Right? Any questions about that? Because that's something that sometimes is, in the present day and age, we can get into heated debates on. So, uh, what makes us unique? Well, if we are, if we believe that we're creating the image and likeness of God, that in and of itself, this idea of the imago dei. Do we write this? Yeah, you want to write. The idea of the Imago Dei is what makes us unique. Now, I'm going to draw a, a little diagram up on the board, and uh, you'll probably, it would benefit you to drop this down, because I think this will help. If you're a visual learner, uh, this should help. Right. When we speak of, of man, of men and women, we speak of, of man having a rational and immortal soul. What does this mean? Well, first of all, we have to look at what man is, is what consists of man, right? For us as Christians, we recognize that man is made up of body and soul, and there's a special distinctness and a special uniqueness to each one, and yet they come together in a very special way. I mean, that's what we are here right now in the flesh. We're both body and soul. And the faculties of the soul, components of the soul, particles of the soul, particle maybe not the best word, but the ability of the soul is the intellect and the will. The intellect and the will. They belong to the soul. They make up the soul. As the slide in front of you says, the intellect helps us to know, and the will helps us to choose or to love. The intellect helps us to know, and the will helps us to choose or to love. The fact that our soul is made up of an intellect and a will, and that us, that we are made up of a body and a rational soul, that makes us unique compared to all other of God's creation. Right? It's also what allows us to say we are, in some ways, the imago dei. We are the image and likeness of God. God shares with us components, aspects of his inner being that allow us to share his divine life back with him. Right, I'm going to play a video, and um, hopefully this video will give you uh, a little better understanding of what we're going for here. It's easy to feel small in this world, to feel insignificant in this universe. But I think God is looking down from heaven saying, you are huge next to all of this. Yeah, there are hundreds of billions of stars.
stars in our galaxy. And over 100 billion galaxies in our universe. That's amazing. You know what's even more amazing? There are tens of trillions of cells in your body. Living cells. Each in its own way more spectacular than a lifeless star. But more awe-inspiring than your physical body, you have a soul. You have an intellect and will. You can know. You can love. You can make choices. More than anything in creation, you are the mirror image of God. Can a mountain, as big as it is, know someone? Can an ocean love? Can a galaxy change directions? No. But you can. And you'll still be around long after all of this has passed away. God had you in mind before the Big Bang. He had you in mind when he created space and time. He had you in mind when he entered space and time to save us. He had you in mind when he hung on the cross. He had you in mind when he rose from the dead. I know physically you feel small in this world. Spiritually? Have any of you heard of uh, Christophonic before? No. He is uh, an up and coming yet. Yeah, Mr. Boy knows my lights. Light specialist thing. Uh, I, I, I snapped earlier, like we planned it, and the lights went off, and the, some of the students who were sleeping were like, oh wow. And, like, you know, they thought I could somehow like, shut the lights off. Eight we're going to try the clapper and see Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do like the whole like, and then watch the lights go down. Because mm -hmm. there's a few in the class that I'll get, I'll probably I'll, like, like trick into, into believing. Mm -hmm. so. All right, so, uh, but Christophonic is an upcoming, uh, he's a, a popular Catholic apologist. Uh, who's got a wife and kids and stuff, and I think he gives a good, a, a good understanding of in this short video of the significance of the Imago Dei, this idea, concept, and the real reality that we are creating the image and likeness of God. Um, the fact that we have a rational soul, the fact that we have the ability to use our intellect and our will, is what makes us unique. Now I warn you that we have to be very careful to keep body and soul distinct from each other, and this is why. Uh, if we're going to say as Christians that after the body dies, the soul continues on for all eternity, which is what Christophonic was saying, right? That if it takes 100,000 years for mountains to decay, that even if you live 75 years on earth and die, that you will far outlive 100,000 years in the eyes of God of mountains falling apart and, and breaking down, right? But if we're willing to say that, we have to then recognize that the intellect and the will are part of the soul and not part of the body. So when we say that the intellect, we exercise our intellect through our mind, our mind, if I have you touch your head, it doesn't mean that you can put your finger on your intellect. Right? But if, and if I say that if the heart is how we use our will, it doesn't mean that your will is somehow contained within your heart. Because if the intellect and the will were only contained in the brain and in the heart, as soon as we would stop breathing, all of this would get thrown away. All of what we believe as Christians would, would be a contradiction. And it's, I mean, truth can't contradict itself. That's why it's called true. Right? It has to be true. If it's not true, then it's false. Even if it's half true, it's not true, then it's false. So, so if we're willing to say that the soul lives on forever, we have to recognize that the intellect and the will are part of the soul and not the body. And yet, when we're here on earth, alive, the body and the soul are connected and work together in, in such a very special way. Okay? Are there any questions? Some of this might seem basic. It also might seem foundational. It might seem like, oh, I know this stuff, or I've never heard this before. I think this guy's crazy. All of the above is great. You're going to see why we need to be able to agree on this in order to even get into uh, specific moral topics. Okay? So I'm going to ask you to do a little exercise with me. Trust me again. Um, what is this? What, what is this? Is that coffee? Is that 
coffee thing. It's a, it's a K cup, right? And what color is it? Black. Black, right? Can everybody look up and see it? It's a black K cup, right? We all agree. Uh, close your eyes. Just trust me. Don't, don't take a nap. Just close your eyes. Right? And so we all agree this was a black K cup. But if I ask you to use your imagination and imagine that this K cup was blue, could you do that? How about if I asked you to imagine if this K-cup was red? Could you do that? How about if I asked you if the K-cup was white? Could you do that? All right, so open your eyes. So uh, basically, you used your mind to uh, use your imagination. Now, you didn't change the K-cup. I have another one, black and white. Um, I, I, I'm trying with each class to stretch it out as long as possible, but some of your faces were like, <laughs> like, oh my god. Like, this guy's for real. He just told me to imagine a white K cup, and like, it happened. Uh, if I had that ability, I would not be studying to be a priest. I'd be like a professional, I don't know, something or another. I'd be in Vegas. I'd be in Vegas, yeah, doing shows, right? But I asked you to use your imagination, okay? And I asked you to imagine that this was a different color. You, at that point, were using this, right? You were using your imagination, you were using your intellect and your will to imagine that even though you knew when you were going to open your eyes that this, this black, it will always be black. This color cannot change unless you paint it. In your mind, you were able to recreate this K-cup a different color. Why can you do that? Because you're a rational soul. Because you have an intellect and a will, and you have the ability to do that. There, are not, there is not another animal in the world some of you disagree with this. There is not another animal in the world that can do what you just did. You can teach a dog a trick. You can teach a bird how to, you know, repeat it. Back, look back to you or whatever you want to teach it, right? But you cannot put this in front of another animal, a dog, a cat, a giraffe, a hyena, whatever, and ask them to close their eyes and use their imagination to say that this isn't really black. Right? There's also this in philosophy, we, uh, we point this out. Uh, has anybody ever heard of this word? It's called, it's called risibility. Anybody know what it means? <laughs> risibility. It's the ability to laugh, which is what Mr. Boyner just did. He laughed. And he thought he was looking at something stupid on his computer. Um, the ability to laugh, risibility, is unique to rational beings. Animals cannot laugh. Now, could you train a bird to make a noise that sounds like a human laugh? Absolutely. Right? I mean, it t almost in an unfair way. Like, birds are so stupid, you can train them. Like, you can tell them what to do, and eventually they're just going to catch on. Can you train your dog to, like, you know, oh, cute, play dead, or all over? Absolutely. I think it's awesome. I have a dog. Like, we do the whole thing. Bang, the dog, you know, falls over like it's dead. But the dog's not thinking, like, oh, bang, dead, the same way that we would process that and think that. It just, it just isn't there. How do we know that? Well, the dog is lacking an intellect and a will. Sometimes we get caught up on this because when we think of animals, we think of our domesticated pets. And if we're honest with, the, with ourselves, we have to realize that our domesticated pets, while they're animals, um, like, if you think about it, like, our dog loves us I shouldn't say loves us. Our dog appreciates us walking. Why, why, does, why does your dog, pet dog appreciate you? And don't tell me because like when you go home, you cuddle with the dog. And, oh, the dog loves me. And like, very basically, why? I love animals, by the way. Like, I'm not like a pet hater. Why? You provide the dog with food. Newsflash, if the dog was out in the wild before we captured dogs and made them domesticated pets hundreds of years ago, they had to fend for their own food. Right? What else do we provide for our pets, like dogs and cats and birds and anything else? I had a lizard growing up, a turtle, rabbits. Shelter. Whatever. Shelter. Right? Like the dog, when it's, it's, I mean, have you been out, you were outside this morning. It's as cold, if not colder, than this morning, which was ridiculous. When I walked out of the center, I was like, you got to be kidding me. I came out like this, and I was like, no glove, like, no, nothing. It was it's freezing, right? 
Dog, I mean, animals die out in the bitter cold because they don't have shelter. You're providing shelter for your dog. Why else does your dog appreciate food, shelter, what else? I don't know about you, but in my house, the dog was not allowed to go to the bathroom inside. Right? Like, we made the dog go outside, he did his business, then came back in. So even that, providing the, an animal to go out and do a natural function, going to the bathroom is a natural process of organisms, right? You take things in and then you get rid of waste. That's anything, right? How about um, even taking care of the dog? Like grooming it, bathing it, petting it, cuddling it, and all that cute stuff that goes with it. But you're taking care of it the way that, you know, the alpha male in a, in a pack of wolves might try to take care of all the other dogs in that pack, right? So while our animals appreciate the things that we can do, basically we've, we've taken them out of, you know, their natural environment and we, we kind of humanize them a little bit, right? It's important for us to remember that our rationality gives us a unique ability to enter into the life of God in a way that no other animal can. Now, all things created in some way, shape, or form share in the life of God, right? I mean, if, if we're going to say that anything God creates is good, well then yes, all of his creation. The birds, the air, the trees, everything. But for us as humans, we share in a very special way with God that nothing else can. I have a question. Yes. I sound really dumb, but... No, there's um, no such thing as a dumb question. Why, um, you're saying that we have the ability to feel and that other, like, animals can't, but how come when you're hurt or something, like, your dog goes to comfort you if they can't feel? How, how is that possible then? It's a good question. Um, when we understand animals... Um, and Mr. Boyno would be the, the uh, expert probably in this because he's a philosopher, not me. And he has a um, <laughs> So, what she say? If I'm not mistaken, Mr. Boyno, was it Aristotle that grouped them into three categories: humans, animals, and plants? Didn't he? Didn't he kind of build on this idea and talk? Yes. Right. So, for instance, when you look at plants, right? Somebody, somebody, pull the shade for a second. Just, just. Up a few inches so we can see daylight. <laughs> Anyone by the... Sh there we go. Thank you, right? So if there would be a plant in here, guess what? Like if we had a plant right here, which way would it try to turn its leaves? Towards the sun. But does that mean the plant feels? Like if you cut a plant, you know, if you cut a leaf off, is it is it crying when we cut the leaf off? Please tell me no. Please do not say yes. You say yes to a serious problem. Now, should we just destroy plants for fun? No, we should just blow things up. Right? We shouldn't just chop trees down for the heck of it. Because you have dominion over them. We're called to take care of them, to be stewards of them. But there's a natural instinct of a plant to go towards sunlight. Why? Because it needs sunlight to survive. Right? There's a natural instinct of animals. We call this the fight or flight. Right? Isn't it interesting that when an animal is faced, like if you've ever been out in the, if you, any of you hunt, you've ever been out in the woods, right? If a deer hears you, what's the problem when a deer hears you? It's going to take off. Why is, why is a deer going to take off when it hears you? It's natural instinct. Its natural instinct is, I don't know what's coming after me. I'm not going to stay and fight. I'm going to, I'm going to fight. I'm going to run. Right? Really? So we do that as humans as well. But then the third level of humans, to answer your question, is we experience even more so than what the plants and animals can do. So while your dog might come to comfort you, if it might come home, you have a bad day, yada, 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 you're crying, and you sit down in the chair and your dog comes over to you. If we're practical and real with ourselves, one, the dog might be coming over to you because it's hungry, it has to go to the bathroom, or it doesn't know what's going on. But if we're willing to say the dog can, you know, kind of not feel our emotions but recognize something wrong, we're doing it on this animal instinct. Right? The same way that a, a mother bird shushels its baby bird out of the nest when it figures out it's time now that this thing needs to learn to fly. Unfortunately, animals are not perfect. Sometimes mother birds push baby birds out and they don't make it. And then there's other times that mama birds push baby birds out and they become the nasty crows that attack you and eat the roadkill on the side of the road. Right? Right? So we'll end here. Next class we'll talk about the uniqueness of human persons. Um, and we'll also uh, continue, all right? Have a good weekend. Uh, tomorrow's Friday. Yay for Friday. Okay? No.
You have a quiz tomorrow too, don't you? Absolutely. Mr. Bueno. Uh,